Hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to come at this at a slightly from a slightly different perspective because I thought, as I've seen here today, that we would have a huge amount of analysis of the evidence we have from a sophisticated group of people who know this body of evidence. So to give you a perspective of where I'm going to come from, so I started in academia in the field, then I went into government for a while in road safety, then I went back to academia for 18 years, then I went back to government as the head of road safety before I eventually ended up doing international work and joining the World Bank. So I'm thinking about it from the point of view of a researcher as well as from the point of view of what it looks like from government when you're trying to manage policy and programs on an evidence base with a pretty good knowledge of that evidence base. And that reveals a great deal about what's going on with it, I think. And so I want to talk about that. Um, so in overview, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the road safety crisis, which we all know, so I'm only going to spend 30 seconds on that just to show you a projection. I, I think that fundamentally, a great deal is known by too few people. And I think therein lies the essence of our problem. Um, the evidence base is not sufficiently adopted. In fact, as we've seen and talked about in previous sessions, quite commonly not adopted at all. And, and I think the reasons for that include some, some pretty consistent misconceptions and errors which we need to address before the evidence base is going to be effectively adopted. Then a few recommendations from the so the road safety crisis, we know I'm going to use the WHO figures because I think they're, they're reasonable projections estimates compared with um, uh, official figures. All I want to show you is the simple, if we simply extrapolate that increase to the next decade, then what we get is in the next decade we will see 14.7 million deaths and 500 million injuries. I, we have a problem with the size or the scale of a world war but it is not being treated like a world war, it is not being resourced like a world war, and we're not taking the problem with the level of seriousness it deserves in terms of the selections we make of policies and the way we spend the extremely limited resources we have. Um, as I said, I think a great deal is known, but by too few people. Some of the evidence I think we need to promote more strongly to address the, the problem of the failure of resource allocation is that people are not focused on deaths per se. They find them acceptable, even though we keep saying in the safe system approach no death is acceptable. That's not the way many governments see deaths <coughs> in their countries. And in fact, they naively use some of the evidence produced. For example, some of those graphs showing a relationship, that peculiar curved relationship between uh, level of economy and number of deaths per 100,000 people to say, look, I, I don't want to deal with road safety. What I want to do is become a high income country. Then I'll deal with road safety because the evidence shows me that only high income countries can do it. Now we know that that's actually a misrepresentation of the evidence, but a simple presentation of the graph will lead to average finance minister or average treasurer to believe that to be the case. And that's part of our problem that sometimes the evidence is presented in very simple ways <coughs> and misinterpreted in very simple ways. Sometimes, therefore, what we need is research to counter the impacts of that. And this is an example of what we did to try and do that. Because what we wanted to show them is actually road safety is one of the retarding effects by which you're not becoming a high-income country. So it's not the case that you become a high-income country, then you deal with road safety. Rather, if you deal with road safety, you've got a faster chance of becoming a high income country. It's the other way around. So we wanted to prove that. Now, what we typically do to prove that is say, well, this is costing your country 5 or 6% of its GDP. And for, for the average person in the street, they'll be shocked at that. So, okay, that piece of evidence is compelling to me. But for your average sophisticated finance minister, when I talk to them, or the average treasurer in the country, they won't say that. What they'll say is actually quite a sophisticated commentary. They'll say, well, okay, it's costing me 5.5% of my GDP, but so what? Because a great deal of that 5.5% is part of my GDP. <coughs> You've included in there all of the doctors, all of the nurses, all of the ambulance 
drivers are paid to see to that. Their wages are part of my GDP. So you can't simply take that out of my GDP. That's just too simple an analysis. And in an economic sense, they're right. So what we thought was, what is a better, compelling piece of research to show the point? So we did an economic analysis with a different question. The question we asked was, if countries met the target, if they halved deaths and serious injuries, what would the impact be on their long-term economic growth? And we analysed the five countries which were then in the Bloomberg Philanthropies Program, because that's where we got the funding. And what we found was over the next 24 years, those countries would grow by an extra 7 to 24%. If they once halved deaths and serious injuries, then continued on the same projection from that 50% base. And that's income per person. So it's not simply that there's more people. It is income per person. So in other words, at the highest level, which by the way was Thailand, Thailand would grow at almost an extra 1% a year if it addressed road safety seriously. Now that is a fun, compelling piece of evidence for the people who are actually making these financing decisions. And so my, the first thing I would say is sometimes the vital research we need is the kind of research we can do which will create the advocacy for resourcing the problem. Um, second, I think I've heard everyone talk about it so far since, since I got here. I'm sorry I wasn't here all day. I had another set of things talking in. But I, I put it to you that simply there is no dispute, I think, in the room that the evidence base is not sufficiently adopted. And there, I think there is no doubt that this is a huge problem that it's not adopted, that we are squandering resources, valuable and limited resources, on ineffective policy positions. Um, so why is that happening? And, and I think there are, there are a number of reasons when, when I talk to governments and present them with research, a number of reasons come back to me which highlight what's going on in the process. Now, some of these are genuine errors. Some of them, I would say, are also very motivated errors. So for example, why is it that we keep coming back to school education as a solution? And in some cases, it's simply they don't get it. And in some cases, it's simply that extrapolate evidence from somewhere else that simply <coughs> says, well, education worked to change X, whether I can add up, whether I can spell, therefore it will work on road safety. It's just a very naive extrapolation of evidence. But sometimes it's motivated. Well, okay, you face me with this problem. I don't have enough resource to deal with it. I don't want to spend a resource on it because I've got data from somewhere else. What is the simplest, cheapest, most politically convenient decision for me to make which will obviate my responsibility? I'll shove this into the curriculum in the school. Then when everyone comes to me and says, what are you doing about this problem? I've got an answer. And only a few academics in the country will know it's the wrong answer. So sometimes it's a motivated error, but sometimes it's a very genuine error. So here's a list of the ones which I see as really common errors, and I focused a little bit on speed because I think it's the one where we get the least policy-oriented positions from government because it's one of the politically hardest. And I'm going to talk through examples of each of these. So, first of all, people simply misjudge risk and they do it on a very personal basis. And, and I think that there are three basic errors sitting behind this. First of all, people are terrible at low probability events. So when I first started doing research on this in the university, I, you know, I, I was starting into how do people see probabilities? If you get your average, you know, fairly smart first year student, in you know, a high-level university in and ask them, what's the probability of you being hit by a car when you cross the road each time you cross the road? Well, one in a thousand. Let's see, and you cross the road 8,000 times in a year, let's say, we work out how many times you cross per day, multiply that out. So you expect to get hit eight times this year. Oh, no, they can't be right. Then what's the probability? Well, one in 5,000? So you're only going to hit once this year. They have no clue about what the probability is. And so when we talk about risk, they don't judge risk. They don't hear that. What they hear is, oh, well, for example, on speeding, 
Okay, so speeding doubles my risk of having a serious crash. If I speed, if I do 65 kilometers an hour in a 60 k zone, I double my risk of having a, an injury or fatal crash. That's, that's a true statistic. But no one believes it. Or if they believe it, they don't believe it applies to them. Why? Because they judge by personal experience. And their personal experience says, and people will tell you this, oh, but I've been speeding for five years and I haven't killed myself, you must be wrong. It's that simple. Or I've been speeding for six months, or I've been speeding for all the time I've been driving, or I've been speeding, you can pick any number you like, that's the answer you'll get. And so the interpretation they make of us telling them numbers that say you double your crash risk, or your serious crash risk, is one of two things. First, we're a bunch of obscure scientific problems and we don't understand the real world and our numbers are just wrong. But the more likely one is, okay, you're right for everyone else. But not for me, because my personal experience says that's not true. And I think that is, so to some extent, what our numbers do therefore is not get people to change their perception of their personal risk, but just feed into their optimism bias. So we all have this psychological delusion about our future. In fact, the only people who don't have are psychologically depressed people, which is a frightening thought. But for the rest of us, if you give people a questionnaire like, compare with your average peers, what are your chances of your home burning down, uh, you being fired from your job, you getting cancer, you dying of nerve heart, all of those would be lower than average. What are your chances of winning an award at work? What are your chances of having a happy relationship, etc.? All of those would be higher than average. We can't all be better than average. But that's actually what the average person will tell you. As I said, you know, maybe. Um, psychological health is a delusion and the only people who see reality become depressed. And that's what you deduce from the scientific evidence on. So, and this applies to road safety. So if you ask people how good a driver are you compared with average, are you much better than average, better than average, average, worse than average, much worse than average, then when we did that study in New South Wales and Australia, that's what we got. Only 2.1% of people believe they're worse than average drivers. Almost all of those were women and were probably the safest drivers. The large majority of people believe they were better than average driver. So when we tell them this, they just say, yep, I'm glad you're telling everyone else that because I've noticed they're a bunch of lunatics, but I'm real delicious. And so in, in a way, our statistics are subverted to service the cause of people believing in their own invulnerability. Now that also applies to decision makers. The average decision maker we talk to, the average minister of transport or the finance minister or whoever, has exactly these features. So when we go in and say we want you to spend this amount of money on this and this amount of money on this, they say, but gee, it's not happening to me. Therefore, all the people it's happening to, it must be their fault. It's not my responsibility. So our numbers are subverted in these odd psychological processes which I think, however, we can address. The second one is, if we start talking about the fundamentals of how we improve safety, and the cheapest fundamental is low on speed. What they will say is, but hang on, you're going to wreck my economy. And they've all seen graphs like this, and all of the development banks give them graphs like this, and give them answers like this. So the huge benefit of increasing speed is a huge time change in travel time, and that has saved money. So your economy will grow if we increase speed. Now, the fundamentals, the way people normally compare things, just don't tell us that's true. But we, we don't go to this kind of simple argument. So in, Sweden is one of the highest income countries per person in the world, with incredibly low speed limits. Why is that true? It just doesn't add up that that graph is true. And that graph is true, but it's only a tiny proportion of the reality. The rest of the reality is this, and this is actually a study from Iran, of what is the economically ideal speed. And these figures are for a motorway, a top quality motorway. <coughs> Complete grade separation, no points of conflict, etc. And when you add up all of the costs, not just the travel time, but you're actually adding the costs of crashes, the cost of the extra pollution, the cost of the extra fuel consumption, etc., then the economically ideal speed for the country on the motorway in Iran is 73 kilometres an hour. But if you go to Iran, 
go to any of these countries with a similar kind of economic base, they will want the speed limit put from 120 to 130, or 100 to 130, because that will improve their economy. Actually, it won't improve their economy at all. But the reason why all of the rest of those graphs don't get considered is because they're externalities and no one argues for them. That minister and that treasurer won't have a group of people coming into their office saying, you're ruining my business because of all the pollution. But they will have transport companies coming in saying, you're ruining my business, can't we put these standards up? So part of the problem is that some of those things which encourage higher speeds have voices screaming for them. But some of those facts which would cause you to lower speeds as good policy, evidence-based policy, don't have a voice. And so part of that problem is that the voices and the realities don't match. Only part of the reality is voiced. Let me take another example. One of the reasons why people resist reducing speeds in cities is because they already are congested. And, and you go into cities and say that you've got 60 and 70 kilometer an hour speed limits everywhere, let's get those um, up, you know, after roads down to 50 and the local roads down to 30, and you'll save a lot of lives. So that's certainly true. They'll say, but it's already congested. If I lower the speeds, it'll get more congested. And so why do people think that? Because fundamentally they think this is the way the graph should look. If you increase speeds, you increase traffic flow. It's unfortunate the way this graph was presented with the vertical and horizontal axis, the non-conventional way around, so it's hard to understand. But that's what they think it is. Increase speeds and you increase traffic flow. Now, let me just present that to remind you that it's absolutely wrong. That's not what happens at all. And in fact, the OECD has a lovely graph that shows what actually happens. So the pink line in this graph is the theoretical line of what should happen if you look carefully what the evidence says will happen. And then the blue dots are actual studies or locations all around the place to show you that actually that pink line is correct. It does line up that way. So actually, your level of throughput of traffic increases for a small increase in speed, then stops and reverses. And when you present that to government, they say, what are you talking about? That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. And so part of another part of that problem is that the evidence is counterintuitive. Because it is counterintuitive to say, if you put speeds up, you'll actually get less throughput of vehicles. There are ways we can present that. So I always say to them, well, think about it this way. This is how I was taught to drive. If you're doing 30 kilometres an hour, 40 kilometres an hour, you need a two second headway to come in front. So you wait until that car passes a pole and you count 1,000, 2,000. If you reach the pole before you reach the 2,000, you're too close. Get further back. If you're driving at 50, 60, you need three seconds. If you're driving at 80 or more, you need four seconds. Now, people don't actually quite do that, but they do something fairly close to that. So if you simply count the throughput of vehicles per lane through an intersection, if they're doing 80 kilometres an hour, you're going to get one vehicle every four seconds. If you're doing 30 kilometres an hour, you're going to get one vehicle every two seconds. So at 30 kilometres an hour, you get twice as many vehicles through an intersection as you do at 80 kilometres an hour. That's just the way we drive, or close to the way we drive. So we can present it, we can make sense of it, but we have to understand that they're starting from the position which is that. So if we don't appreciate what their resistance is to the policy, we won't know what it is that we need to present as the evidence to counter that resistance. So I think part of what we need to do is become more sophisticated about listening to our audience. What is it that they believe that is causing them to ignore the research evidence so that we know what evidence we need to present to overcome that barrier? Um, there are also a lot of common sense misjudgments. And difference in speed is a classic. So we say 10 kilometres an hour difference in speed makes a huge impact. And I say, well, 10 kilometres, that doesn't sound like a lot to me. It's not much of an impact. But you know, when you consider, OK, if I'm doing 100 versus 110 at the start of 
and in the structured scenario. What is the impact speed of this? So I'm looking ahead, I see someone sitting on the road and I'm doing 100. Suppose I'm far enough back to just stop in time. If I'm doing 110 back here when I first see them, what speed am I going to get them? And people will say, well, 10. Actually, the correct answer is 59. 10 kilometres an hour speed difference at the beginning creates 59 kilometres an hour speed difference at the end because you're that much closer before you reach the brakes and then your deceleration is not simple straight line. So 10 kilometres at the beginning makes a gigantic difference at the end, but we don't present that. And that is, of course, the difference between no injury and around a 95% chance of fatality. So 10 kilometres an hour difference at the beginning makes a huge difference to the end result. One of the other things we hear is people don't want speed humps. People don't want speed humps. As, as uh, Dinesh just showed, there are thousands of informal speed humps around India. These are photos I've taken in other countries where people will use anything to create the informal speed hump because they do want speed humps in their village where their children live, where their children have been here. So, but we, you know, if I were presenting to a government to try and get them to do speed management. I wouldn't present any fancy photos of a speed camera, I'd present those photos. So this is what your community wants. Um, I think one of the other things we do is we, we fail to address the political limitations. So very often I hear, well, okay, I want this policy, but actually there's a lot of community resistance, therefore I can't get it. Instead of thinking, okay, there's a lot of community resistance, how do I overcome that community resistance? How do we get there? I want to show you a, uh, a, um, an ad we ran in New South Wales and Australia to try and overcome the community resistance to speed enforcement. And this was incredibly successful in allowing me to then get government to give me a lot more speed cameras and speed changes. Um, so if you float it on the picture, but, um, I don't have a touch screen, so I can't really do it. Well, we had it just now. Move the cursor up there yeah. and then put the arrow. Oh, I can't see the cursor on the there screen. Oh, we didn't copy it. I forgot to put it through the episode. We won't show that. <laughs> um, Then, you know, I think there are quite a few errors in selection of interventions, and we've talked a lot about teaching school children as one of the basics, or vehicle handling skills, etc. And we all know the evidence that these don't work, yet the common sense says they should. So this is a deep challenge for us to present that evidence. And, and even now, when I present that evidence, I, you know, I've presented it in the World Bank and say, Let's never support this. I was like, you can't say that. You just can't say, well, why can't I say it? Is the evidence. Oh, that can't be right. So even people who know the field, will be, even people who know other parts of the field, like good engineers in their take and good airport, simply find this incomprehensible that this is true. The resistance to it is extraordinary. And, and I think there is a fundamental underlying psychological reason for and that is that mostly we think of road safety, especially where, in terms of what road users do, as being a skill problem and a knowledge problem. But it's not. The errors road users make are mostly a motivational problem. They're not a skill problem, they're not a knowledge problem. Therefore, skill training and therefore education to give knowledge are not the right interventions. But if you think about the basic errors, People drive at 60 kilometres an hour in a 50 zone. Is that because they don't know what 60 is? It's not a knowledge problem. Is that because they don't have the skill? It's not a skill problem, it's a motivational problem. They're not motivated to stick to the speed limit. People don't wear a seatbelt. It's not a skill problem, it's a motivational problem. They don't wear a helmet. Skill problem, not a motivation. A motivation problem, not a skill problem. Not a knowledge problem. But too often, we think of this as being a knowledge problem. So, now, I think this is just about my last example. 
one of the other things that pipes me, and this is a photo I took on a rural highway in, in a, a desert area of Chad. And people look at this, and this is the way an engineer will look at that road. Okay, what have I got? I've got a big wide road, the surface is pretty good, it's a highway, speed limit should be 80, 90 or 100. But actually, the way the road is used is completely different. So here's the rest of that photo I took. It's not a highway, is it? It's a strip shopping mall. You know, this, these little huts on the side, that's a restaurant. People are selling things all along this road, even though, as you can take a look, it's a desert area, if you look at the right-hand side of that photo. So it was built as a highway. It looks like a highway. It's not being used as a highway, but it's still speeding as though it's a highway because we're focused on what was the purpose of the road. Therefore, this is its speed. Instead of how are people actually using the road, therefore, this is the correct speed. But, you know, when you look at the outside of the road, the way it's been used, that's a 30 kilometer road, not an 80 kilometer road. But it's still speed limited 80. Because we're looking at the wrong factors in applying the evidence. So, from all of that, I know I'm out of time. To me, the take home message is that we do have, and we are continuing to expand this massive body of relevant evidence, but too few people know it. And, and part of our problem is, if I ask around the room, who's a researcher? Who's a government policy creator in the room? Who's a researcher? Okay, who's a government policy creator? Stephen, you and I, have been so that's the problem, isn't it? Now, people usually say, oh, you've done something wrong. We haven't done anything wrong. We have a different kind of problem. This is the session that all these people should have attended. But they didn't. And it, it's a great pity because there was huge value in these messages. And, and so we've got to reach an audience other than this one. Somehow, and I know a lot of us are trying to and are succeeding. That's the effort we need to maintain as well. I think that, as Dinesh said earlier, to an extent we can't just blame the politicians. We have to get in their faces with this evidence base and push them. Um, I, would, I would say, therefore, the recommendations are we need more research on how to get the evidence base adopted. Sometimes we just keep research in the evidence base. To an extent, we need more research on how to get that adopted. We need research of why it's not adopted and how to overcome that psychologically. Um, we need more advocacy to the community and what the evidence base says. And we need more ed education of decision makers in what that says. And the last thing I would say is we need road safety to be led by experts in road safety. It's too much in the world of generalist management. Oh, this person can manage that, therefore they can manage road safety. They know nothing about road safety. No, they can't manage road safety. They will just become one of the barriers to road safety. We need the experts in road safety, the people who know the evidence space, to be the people taking those jobs in government that actually run road safety. And I think those things would help us overcome the limited extent of adoption of this fantastic evidence base we have developed. And with that, thank you for your attention.